listen and learn. Wow. All right. That's better than I expected. That's good. You still got it. Hey. You you still got it. Not bad. Not bad at all. Not bad at all. What's good with you, man? It's all good. It's all good. All right. It's all good, everybody. It's all good. Welcome to the Look, Listen, and Learn show with uh, me, myself, Master G. And I'm joined by the uh, undoubtedly (laughs) educationally knowledgeable Jake Wan. So, peace, peace. Yeah, peace, peace, peace. So, you know, we're calling this show uh, The Journey, and the reason why we're calling it The Journey is because, uh, unbeknownst to the world, I've wanted to be a part of radio since the beginning of time, really. Okay. Yeah, beginning of time. And, and the long and short of it is that as a child uh, in New York City, there was a DJ and his name was Frankie Crocker. Oh, yeah. The Chief Rocker. Chief Rocker Frankie Crocker. Right. And my dad was a private pilot, and he uh, taught flying, and he, and he did all these different things. Frankie was a friend of the family, so he used to come to our house in Teaneck, New Jersey. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So I rode around in his Rolls Royce when I was probably nine or ten years old. He had a beige Rolls Royce. So you knew Frankie Crocker before you even got into the music business. Yes. That's that's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I knew him, and I actually flew in his plane. He had a uh, 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 twin-engine. Right. He had a twin-engine plane. He kept at Teterboro Airport, and my dad and I would take him up, and my dad would, you know, run him through, you know, the procedures for flying. Right, right. But the whole time that he was always on the radio, I, you know, I was like, man, Frank, he, that's who I want to be. Yeah, he was fly. He, he, See, he, he, came, he, came in the, he came in the Studio 54 on a white horse. Right. So, See, I mean, that's like... It was always presentation with him. Oh, man. Right, so he, he would always be dressed fly, and he right. drove a fly car and the whole right. nine yards. So exactly. I figured, man, you know, that's what I want to do. Sure. My dad wanted me to be a pilot, but mm-hmm. I, I was like, no, Dad, this is what I want to do. So that was my goal. Okay. So my goal was I was going to go to... Um, a broadcasting school, uh-huh, uh-huh. and I was going to become the next Frankie Crocker. Now, uh-huh. during that time, because uh, you know, going in, going on in our neighborhood mm-hmm. was the thing that was happening in New York. Sure, which was DJing and, and, right. and rapping, DJing right. and rapping. Exactly. So, right about that time, right around '77, mm-hmm. I got the idea. By this time, I was living in Hackensack. I got the idea to. Start DJing okay. in my neighborhood to make okay. a little money. That's right. And then I got turned on to rapping by an upperclassman. Okay. So so now I'm rapping. I'm doing this thing. I'm going through Hackensack. I'm in I'm in Englewood and I'm moving around. And by happenstance, I run into Sylvia. Hold on there. So so rap music had reached Jersey just through tapes. You were getting word of mouth. Word, okay. I had never, even, never heard it. I had never oh. heard anybody rapping. From New York. Okay. The only person I heard rapping was a guy named Mark Green, who was an upperclassman. He went to my school, and I heard him rapping at a party in Hackensack. And is that Mark Green of Celebrity? Yes. Uh, Okay. That's my man. There you go. Mark Green. What's up, Mark? Shout out to Mark Green. That's right. Yeah. So Mark Green. So it's funny, because Mark Green is the... Mark Green from Celebrity Booking is the mm-hmm. person that turned me on to rapping. Right. And then a Mar- another, another Mark, Mark Green, Green right. was the individual that, of course, introduced me to Sylvie. Right, okay. And so, and so, and so that's, what this is, this, that's what this is really all about. In the process of me meeting Sylvia, of course, one thing led to another, and I recorded uh-huh. uh, Rapper's Delight in the summer of 79. Uh-huh. I just got totally blown away. Yeah. You know. And you met Sylvia where? I bet Sylvia in front of a pizza parlor. Now, Jacob, if you could bring up the uh, crispy crust. Jacob, if you could bring up image the crispy crust image. There it is, right there. Yeah, and that my man Mike from Epps Ave gave me that picture years ago. But that place wow. is still there. That pizza place yes. is still there. And believe it or not, there is a plaque. Oh wow, I was wondering. Yes. Okay. There is a plaque in crispy crust that says, "Guy O'Brien." Lived here, blah 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 blah, and that Sugar Hill Gang was discovered. It's only right. That's a that's a that's a national it's, landmark it, it, for yes. Bob because yeah. that's where that's where Hank was was and Hank was, was making pieces. And still, you know, as the story goes, you tell it. You know it better than I do. Oh well, you know, <laughs> I don't want to jump you out of your timeline, but no, 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 no. But well, the the whole situation is that we knew Hank mm-hmm. as the guy from the Bronx, right? Who made pieces, right? In Crispy Crust, right? 
which was a which was an amazing thing because uh, keeping it a hundred, black people didn't make pizza. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if I if I walked into a pizza spot and saw right. a black guy making pizzas, I don't it know. Was, I, it, I might turn around. Yeah, it was it was like it was mind blowing. <laughs> right, it was mind blowing. And then on top of that, he could rap. So you know. But what I always wondered was, I know that Hank used to manage the Cold Crush Brothers, and everybody from that time told me that Hank used to be a bouncer in a club called Sparkle in the Bronx. So how, how how was he ending up working in Jersey? That's a nice distance. How, why well, was he there? Well, first of all, Hank came from a couple of dollars. His people had some money, so okay. he had a car, you know, ah. which was uh, amazing at right. that time. Right. So he was able to ride from the Bronx into Jersey, and he knew the people that owned the pizza pop. Oh, they were friends gotcha, of his. Got you. Okay. And that's where he got the connection. So they taught him how to make pizzas. Okay. And um and and but he was every time he would be in a pizza parlor, you could see him in the back and he'd be standing back and he'd start rapping. Yeah, right, and, right. You know, we all knew, you yeah. know, when we came in to buy a slice, exactly. You know, the guy Hank would um, you know, do that. So, okay. Wow. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. So I guess I didn't want to jump y'all to your timeline. So No, that's cool. So, you know, in in the process of your journey, you you meet Sylvia. Now, there's already a kind of a impromptu audition going on right. in a car at this point, yes, right? I yes. think Joey Jr. is driving. Joey Jr. is driving. Okay. Sylvia's in the passenger seat, and I'm walking down the street. As I walk down the street, Mark Green uh -huh. is stops and speaks to the celebrity celebrity town. No, Mark Green. no, the other Mark, Mark Green. Right? Okay. Yes, Mark, Mark Green. Mark Green number one. We'll call him. So okay. we call him light skinned Mark Green. Ah. Turn me on to rapping, and dark skinned Mark Green is the one. Gotcha. That, that's a good. That got me. That's a good description. The, uh, audition. He helped me get the gotcha. audition. So okay. dark skinned Mark Green says to Joey, "What are you doing?" Mm -hmm. And um, so Joey says, "Well, my mom is looking for some people to rap." Right. And I was like, "Oh snap, that's Sylvia." So right. I didn't even know it was Sylvia till he said his mom is right. looking for people to rap. Mm -hmm. So Mark Green was like, "Well, you want to hear somebody rap? You, you need to listen to Guy because right. you know Guy, psh, right. known in the area for rapping and doing parties." Has Hank done his part already? At Hank that point? was in the back. Hank of the was car. in the car already. He was already in the car. He was sitting in the back seat. I got in the back seat. Mark Green and I got in the back seat. I got to fix my thing. Hold on one second. I got to fix my prop. Okay. <laughs> All right, uh, <laughs> that's for my wife. <laughs> oh, got you. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. So, um, Mark Green sitting in in a car. I'm sitting in a car, and Sylvia's in the passenger seat, and I start rapping. Oh, Sylvia's in the car too. She was in the car. Now I never knew that. I mm -hmm. thought, okay, I thought Joey went home and said, "Mommy, you know, uh, no. this happened today." Oh, she was no. there. Okay, because they were looking for they were looking for a guy named Casper, who was right, part of Sound on right, Sound, uh -huh. who originally were go was going to be the one vocalist on the record. Right. Casper turned them down. That's right. They were in front of the McDonald's, so they made a U-turn because they heard about Hank, wow. the guy from the pizza the parlor from the Bronx that rapped, and they wanted to hear him. And then I walked on up into the situation. So she was in the car, because they were going to go to the studio that night and record the lyrics. So Casper turning this down... And I think they, I think Mike told me, Wonder Mike told me that his parents advised against him signing the contract. Yeah, so okay. did Mike. Okay. So, wow. Yeah. Just that turn of events. Right. In in real time. So how does Mike get into the car, or to, Mike, into the situation? Well, well, Mike had been, Mike heard, they heard Mike on the tape. Because right. initially when, when Sylvia got the, the concept or the idea to do it, um, they were looking for uh, DJs. And, and Mike's DJ was a guy named Ron McBean. Right. And it was, he the was mixer. DJ. Ron the Mad Mixer. Right. Ron right. the Mad right. Mixer. He mm -hmm. was with a group called Sound on Sound. Right. And of course, Mike was with that group. Right. So they heard a cassette of Mike, but the reason why she didn't like Mike, uh, she didn't like Mike is because he didn't sound, he didn't, he didn't come across on the cassette. Yeah. That's why they picked Casper, because he yeah. had a better voice. He had a better voice. Right. Right. But Mike actually had a cold at that time. Yep, exactly. And he didn't, he wasn't really in, in, in his best uh, exactly. uh, situation. So that's basically really... What happened? So uh, upon the audition, at we all went to Sylvia's house to, you know, now thinking it's going to be one person. We all went to Sylvia's house, and you know, I'm me, me and Hank are going back and forth. And I tell this story a lot, but every time I tell it, it, it gives me the chuckles because right, I'm always thinking, you know, he's sitting there and he keeps saying the same rhymes over and over again. Isn't that same something? rhymes over. And I'm in my head right. every time it comes back to me. It's like, okay, let me say something good. You know, I got to try because I'm thinking it's going to be one person. Okay? Right. Finally, she says, okay, well, you know what? I'll think about it. And then Mike wants to audition right before she goes to bed. Right. And then at that point, that's when she said, look, you know, I think that three is being my favorite number. I'm mm -hmm. not going to choose one of you. I'm going to put all three of you together. Yeah. And, of course, you know, we ended up going down the road. It's funny you say that because oh I know. Oh, my God. Look at this. 
Wow. Yeah, that's Sylvia in the middle. Wow. And I think that was in the fever. I think that was in the back that of the fever. That is in the fever. Yeah. That is in the Something fever. Something that I snatched up. Um, yeah. So, Jay Kwan has the, the most amazing <laughs> stuff. Hey, I appreciate it. But, Man. yeah, that's... Um, so that's early. That's early 1979, 1980. Uh, Hip-hop is virtually still the street. Mm-hmm. You know, the most commercially successful situation with hip hop at that point was us was it right, right. was us exactly you know, um uh, uh curtis hadn't come out at the time uh, nobody was that brings me to cuz a lot of people and a lot of them quite honestly are people who wish to in some kind of way degrade the legacy of the sugar hill gang they'll right. say oh well, you know king Tim the third was first and they make it look like King Tim III was first by like a year. What people don't recognize is, the, I think y'all's record dropped sometime maybe September, October. Yes, but let me let me say this sure. in, in defense of Fatback Band. Sure. Okay, because Fatback Band, uh, they recorded King Tim. Right. Okay, and they did release their record first. Sure, but it had to be by weeks though. It was. Re- it came out a few weeks, but we didn't really hit until. Much later on, that, right? That September, right? So, 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 Tim's record was out in the summer, but it was barely, barely getting daylight. Exactly, you know, exactly. You, it wasn't being really recognized. Okay. And then, of course, when Rappers Delight came out, you know, it went on a radio station. It was WKTU. It was actually the station, the first station yeah. in New York to I play remember. Rappers Delight was WKTU. Yeah. Okay, and that should be a fly, Jacob. And that's the first. Go back to that for a second, your mind. That's that's the first LP. Yes. I always wonder where were you. Do you remember where y'all were performing? I, of course, I that? do. I, of course, I do. <laughs> great, great. That picture mm-hmm. is the first concert that we ever did. It was at a place called the Paradiso in Newark, New Jersey, okay. on Broad Street. Wow. And what it was was an old theater that they they, they turned into a discotheque. Okay. And so we, I'm, you, I'm, I'm dating myself by saying uh, disco tech. Right? You didn't even say disco. You said disco tech. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> but it was it was a it was a it was an old disc. It was a, it was a theater that they turned into a disco. Right. And we did a matinee mm-hmm. uh, the next day, and the Friday night we did the first performance. Okay. And Sylvia had a photographer come and take that that picture. Oh wow. And <clears throat> excuse me, with that picture. Of course, moving on, we had to have an album. We needed an album because once Rappers Delight came out, it was a huge success. Now we needed to put out an album. That was what they used for the uh, album cover. Okay, now let me go back a little bit. I'm glad you said Sylvia because it was a thought that had been in my head and I lost it. And you said okay. Sylvia brought it back up. So when she said, I'll marry the three of you, you said something very important. You said that she was in the numbers and she was in the numerology from everybody that I've talked to. Yeah. She, she said, in fact, I, w- I was told that she said something along the lines of, I had success with the moments who people that don't know who the moments are later they become became Ray Goodman and Brown. Yes. She said I had success with them as a three person group. Yes. And three is a good number. And I remember um, Mel and some more guys from the Furious Five telling me that when they finished the message, it was like seven minutes and eleven seconds. And mm-hmm. she 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 knew that kind of stuff. She yes. said, Okay, this is gonna be a hit because it's seven minutes and eleven yes. seconds. And seven means this, and she was right. Uh, no question. <laughs> well, and that's the thing that I want people to remember most about Sylvia, because Unfortunately, there's a lot of darkness that's connected Certainly. to Sugar Hill Records. There's right. a lot of darkness connected to Sylvia and Joe. Exactly. You know, and it's unfortunate. It really is because we are the death jam. We right. are death row. We are the beginning of this thing, period, it, point blank. Jacob, is there a picture that says Joe or maybe uh, Sugar Hill Joe? Maybe Joe and Sylvia. There's a, a picture that says Joe, not not that one. That's, no, that's uh, Joe. That's, that's Joe, Joe the rapper. That's Joe Baton. Right? Yeah, the that's a rap o Yeah, right? a rap o clap Yeah, there should be a picture with 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 Joe in there. But um, right. So 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 what I'm saying is that what you have to do is recognize that one creatively mm-hmm. Sylvia was spot on. She okay. was into vibrations and cosmic, but she also understood music. She understood vocal tones. She was a real producer. She, she was extreme. She was a definite. She was a great producer. Right. She had the ear. You know, like they say Puffy, they say Puffy all the time. He has the ear. That's one of the sure. that's sure. one of his greatest, you know, attributes is that he has the ear. Yes. And he and he does. Yes. You know, he's he picks Certainly. you know Sylvia had that. And, yes. and 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 what and what and what impresses me most about Sylvia is that she was a R and B singer yeah. who did doo wop who transitioned into rap. She knew nothing about rap music. Exactly. Well, she didn't know she didn't know anything about rapping. 
Mm -hmm. But because when you're a musician, and, and you can understand this, and sometimes the public uh, has to grasp this. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, you'll see a musician might be able to play four or five instruments. Exactly. Well, if you can play the keyboards, mm -hmm. you basically understand notes. Yep. So you take yep. that and you transition it to the bass, mm -hmm. plus you understand rhythm, and the same thing with the drums. Right. And that's the same thing with a person like Sylvia who understood vocal tones, who understood melodies, who understood... She was able to take those ingredients and apply them to rapping. And she knew, she knew that she had... When she first heard it, she knew she had and something. And she knew, she knew what she heard when she heard it. When she heard me, she knew. So that track for Rapper's Delight was already recorded because Casper was going to do it. So when y'all went into the studio, the music, the instrumental bed for Rapper's Delight was, was already, already there. there. Okay. Yes. And because uh, um, the reason why it was good times, and people mm -hmm. ask me this all the time, is the reason why it was good times is because that's what we were using in the parties. We were right. breaking. We, using, you know, we were using that break because it was so yeah. long. Yeah. It was straight, just the bass line yep, yeah. and the drums. Everybody was using that. that Everybody yeah. was using that. That was a record that so, someone, right? So once again, Ron mm -hmm. said to Sylvia, this is the music that you want to use. And I, I, think, I, I think we talked about this before. If they would have asked me, mm -hmm. being a DJ too, right. I would have used Dance to the Drums beat. Exactly. In fact, you told me you used to backspin that at parties. When All you the were time. DJing, you used that to was my main copies, record. Right. That was my main record. Dance to the Drummer's Beat was my main record that I used to work off because... Classic break beat. Right. Because at the day, and back in them days, I used to have two turntables. I had a turntable here, a turntable here, and then I had my mixer right here. Okay. So I was rapping and spinning. Right. So I used to use Dance to the Drummer's Beat because Drummer's Beat was a long break. Exactly. Yeah. So I could put it, I could cut it in, mm -hmm. go ahead and rock. Sure. And then I knew, you know, just basically when it's get, and I could cut the other one in and right. keep going. So that used to be my go-to, and it was the record. Like I said, if, if like Good Times was, the, let's say the number one record. Yeah, Dance to the Drums beat was one A. Yeah, you know, it wasn't it definitely even was. two. Yeah. You know, it was one A. Yeah, and probably would, uh, and and that's Herman Kelly in life because Herman yes. Kelly. I don't know if he's still with us or not, but I know one of his gripes was that he never really got his recognition for and that. And he should have. And he should have. So and her he definitely should have. Yeah, Herman. I think that was on TK Records, but it was. Yeah. Very good. So uh, he, um, he knows all this stuff. <laughs> and I would say number three at that point would have probably been Bounce Rock Skate by uh, Bob oh, Mason. That was and, no, no, that was no. Another, and I had the same bass line. It, it, well, it was the same thing. Yep, same bass and line. And I actually, and I shout out to Bob Mason because I've seen him on the road, you know, touring yes. and traveling. And, yes. And he's a very cool cat and very good people. And, mm -hmm. and yes. He, he was very intricate. And, of course, following in that situation was the Queen situation. Right. Yep. Same bass line. And for, to further with that, and this is a whole story in itself, that bass line, if you check out uh, when Curtis came with uh, Christmas Rapper. Right. Which was not too long after uh, Rapper's Delight. Exactly. So, so that, that Good Times break, it, it really played an integral part in the, er, in the first early few rap records. Yes. Well, Curtis was the first rap record I heard other than ours. Yeah. Mine too. Yes. Mine too. In fact, that made me, I, I knew I wanted to rap when I heard y'all. I was like, okay, this. I, I was put here to do this. When I heard Rappers Delight, I was like, okay, I'm supposed to be doing this. So I put away all my comic books and everything that a nine-year-old would be interested in at that point. I'm like, okay, I'm supposed to do this. Right. And then me and my mother were in the store. It was like 1980. And I remember the breaks. It was a yellow record cover. Uh -huh. And it, it was one of the few rap records that had an instrumental. And it said, instrumental, do it yourself. And I was like, okay. And that's when I started writing my little rhymes at home. You know, with my little, you know. I had the same segues as everybody else to yes, yes, y'all. And I've been able to put my own little pieces in there. Right. And that, that's what started. It started me, Rappers Delight and the Breaks. And I'm sure, you know, just watching documentaries, I was watching somebody from Wu-Tang, like maybe you got And he was saying, oh, yeah, the first rap record I had was, you know, one of, of course, those records. Of course. So of course. You, you, you know, sitting here with me, I know you might not see it this way because it's your life that you live. But, you know, you're, you're a third of the group that set it off for a lot of cats, especially outside of New York, to say, oh, okay, I want to pick the mic up and do that. And that's very important. You know, what What happens when you do things, and, and, and this kind of, you know, we're going to kind of get away from, sure. you know, the music sure. and get into life. Certainly. What happens when you do things, you don't know that the history is being created when it happens. Exactly. You just go with your instinct. And I've mm -hmm. been really kind of, all day I've been kind of on this. Yeah. You know, going with what's organically happening. Right. I, I didn't always... And I don't always. A lot of times people will come to me and they'll say, well, how are we going to fix this situation? Right. And I say to them a lot of times, I really don't know. Right. But I will figure it out. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and through just moving forward, and that's the key. That's why I'm calling this show The Journey. Mm -hmm. This show is a direct result 
of continually moving forward. Right. And I've seen in my life, and a lot of times, a lot of people, man, that they ask me, well, you know, gee, how did you, how did you end up here? And, or, or, or what happened here? Or how is it possible that you're able to? And at mm -hmm. the end of the day, the only thing that really works is the fact that I just, even if I don't know. Yeah, you just keep going. I just keep going mm -hmm. and I figure it out. Yeah. And that's the thing, man. You yeah. know, that can be applied in so many different. That's things. my Not point. just the music, right? Yeah. And that's a great point. It can be, a, you know, you just keep going, even when you don't know why you're doing it. You just continue. Even if, even if you don't know how you're doing it, right? <laughs> you know, just that's so you know, true. I, I, and I listen to people. You know, it, when it comes to, you know, maybe you're at, you're at your job, you know, and, mm -hmm. and they and they come to you and they say, "We want you to do this," right? If they didn't believe in you, they wouldn't bring it to you. Exactly. You know, and exactly. and, 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 and and so you have to recognize. What happens in front of you? Certainly. So you can keep on. And, and the other thing, my other thing is, I I work to say to people is, in order to get to it, you got to go through it. Very true. You know, and I've been Very saying true. a lot of cliches all day. Yeah, but they're true. I've been they're on true. cliches all day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they, they they're very true. Yeah. So, so yeah. So so within that within that journey, if you were about to say something, you you go ahead. I don't want to cut you off. No, no. All I'm saying is that 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 what has to happen is you have to. Fix it in your brain that even if you don't know what you're doing, mm -hmm. you do know what you're doing because you know how to move forward. Certainly. And then let everything else come into play. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Now, you know, just piecing the puzzle together, you know, getting to the later, the later years or your last, before we get to your last years at, yes. the, at the label. Yeah, at the label. Um, in between that, you know, y'all did some stuff that is such a big part of pop culture now. So going back and looking at the first album, you said that, you know, she took, you took the pictures at the theater or whatever. Yes. Um, I yes. guess Rapper's Light was so big, she knew that she had to follow up with something. Oh, no question. They were asking for an album. Okay. You know, the, you know, the, the, you know, the, people, the public wanted an album, you know, cause at, mm -hmm. especially at that time. You, know, they, you, you did a single, but the single followed an album. You know, they needed to be an album. Right. Well, to show you how far ahead of everything you guys were, if Jacob could bring up the eight tracks, outside of Curtis Blow, you wow. guys were the only people to have a... Uh, a eight track that is rap cool. album. And that is somebody's cool. selling one on eBay now for like a hundred and something. And I've, I've seen it sell for at least 75 or 80 bucks. So that, wow. you know, the, the history is that significant that somebody would pay that much for an eight that's, track. That's, that's amazing. Album. That's amazing. So yeah. it's the only other person who fell in that time for that format to even be relevant was Curtis Blow. Yes. But shout out to Curtis. So Eighth Wonder wasn't even an issue at that point. You had, you know, rappers reprise. You had a couple yeah. songs. I think Craig Derry and some more people from right uh, from the Sugar Hill House Band sang on some of those songs. But you had rappers reprise with the Sequence, which was a, a new group yes. at the time. Yes, they were. And of course, you know, we know what that ended up becoming. Yeah. Definitely, Angie Stone. She came out of uh, Sequence. Out of Sequence. Exactly. And a lot of people don't realize that. But, they don't. They yeah, don't. you know, that was uh, that was the beginning of her situation. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, and one of my favorite song, my favorite song period that y'all ever did was Sugar Hill Groove. That was it's a great record. Not, not a lot of people talk about that one. I remember, I remember when I, the first time I ever interviewed Kool Mo D, and we were just talking about Sugar Hill stuff, and he was asking me, you know, what I had, and I was like, I basically got all the Sugar Hill stuff. He's like, Can you make me a, a CD with Sugar Hill Groove on it? And mm. I mean, everybody loves that record. It's just one. Yeah, I don't know if it charted or what, but it, you know, it, it, the thing about the albums during those days mm -hmm. is that you were pretty much maybe one or two songs you figured everybody was going to go for. Right. And then you just kind of had to have stuff on there. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's kind of what we did with uh, Chicken Hill Groove was actually another breakbeat. It was. Um, it, it, was uh, it was a song called Catch a Groove. Catch a Groove. Yeah. Mixed with Glide. It was two breaks. And it was Glide by... It, um, by, Catch by, uh, by Pleasure. By Pleasure, right. Yes, Pleasure. And, and Catch a Groove. And Catch a Groove. Yep, yep. And yep. so that's where Sugar Hill Groove came from. Yeah. And we were looking to see what was going to work because we didn't know. Right. You know, at that point, we didn't know. And, you know, that's really where we were uh, with the album. And, uh, you know, things moving forward, that, that, that's where we ended up. And y'all had a world famous percussionist on that album, on, on, on that song, Sugar Hill Group. Tito Puente. Yeah. Tito and Puente. He, he showed his, showed which his was ass a, on that record. About, which was another friend of Sylvia. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She was connected. Yeah. Yeah. So and, he was, lived, was, and he lived in Teaneck. Mm, wow. So Tito Puente lived in Teaneck. She called him in. He mm -hmm. came down to the studio and came in, was you know cordial, and laid that down, laid that track down. Okay. Yeah, definitely cool. So, so then to follow that up with Eighth Wonder, and that to be such a big part of popular culture, even today. And then Apache, which is you know just over the, the Egyptian outfit. Yeah, they, they, they we had a, we had a conversation about this outfit. Yeah, and, and if you want to get into that, what 
What's that outfit? That, for that, those that, that might not know. Yeah, that's not funny. And I heard some chuckles. That's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, let me explain something to you about. <laughs> let me explain. Thank you. Put that back up. That. Hey man, you had your knees low. low hey, up. hey, you, I did. I had you weren't ashy. No, I had to make hey, sure you, I wasn't hey, ashy. Hey, you. One, I would had to make sure I wasn't ashy. Hey man. Two, you could tell I got a little bit more size on me now, thank God. Right. But I was a little, I was a little meal deprived. It looked like. <laughs> <laughs> now you were a little. Cut, I was man. eating you, good. You, you were cut. You didn't... I was eating good, but you know. Yeah. The, the long and short of that is that we uh, at that time it was now video situations. Right. First of all, two things about that. It was my 19th birthday when mm -hmm. that picture was taken. Right. And we literally shot that in Manhattan mm -hmm. and went to a Broadway theater studio rental place. Right. Somewhere in Midtown. I can't tell you where the place is or the, where the... But, sure. And we went through the aisles. And so the whole idea for me was, because, you know, I'm, I'm a big movie buff. Sure. I watch film like crazy, even uh -huh. back in those days. So, you know, I was watching... Uh, uh, you, you know, Ulysses and Hercules and uh, all mm -hmm. of these different movies. Right. And I would always see the Romans and the Egyptians with these outfits, you know, the metallic things. That's why you okay. see the, 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 the arm sure. plates. Yep. And, yep. The, and so I said, man, I want to, you know, I want to look like a warrior. Certainly. You know, I want to, and, and, and that's, and that's the key. There's another tidbit in that situation. That collar actually was a collar that came up here in a metal like a gold metallic thing went around it. Oh wow! Okay, but it didn't photograph well. It was, uh, it was giving okay. off too much of a reflection. Yeah, shiny. So yeah. me being the fashionista that I've become, <laughs> or became, or whatever, however you use it, I thought, okay, well, I'm gonna take the. I took the metal thing off and uh -huh. I, I folded the collar uh. in like that. I fold, so oh, then, okay, see, okay. And then I was trying to be halfway sexy in them days. Uh huh. So, uh -huh. <laughs> so I folded it down because I used to wear a lot of low cut things uh -huh. on the stage, uh -huh. and I made that. So that's really just rolled under. <laughs> that's funny. That's funny. You know, one thing that I one thing that I noticed in in this era, you know, this was when it was still okay for rappers to smile. Um, if right. Jacob, if Jacob could bring up, I think it's one called G Solo. Jacob um, should be in there. Well, you weren't smiling on that one. I would bring the one where you weren't smiling. Whoa. That's one of the few pictures that I've seen of you where you weren't. But at, that's when I was handsome. <laughs> at the time, you know, um, you were smiling in most of the pictures. Oh most yeah, of the promotional pictures. Yeah, I'm, both the all, all three of you were. Yeah, were, were yeah, most yeah. Of the promotional pictures. Huh? Well, because and here's the thing too, and it's, I'm glad you know. Again, going back to the journey, we have to get people to understand that my reality is not the same reality as. Let's say what was happening in Compton, you know, when when, exactly. when 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 let's say Ice Cube and you know Easy E and you know and a shout out to all of them and all the amazing music that they've created and all the things that they've done and certainly all I guess so much respect for all of them, mm -hmm. you know, and God rest his soul, Easy E and mm -hmm. of course Dre, yeah, definitely, you know, oh, definitely. Well, our question, my reality was different from their reality. Mm -hmm. I came up. In a decent and, and like a pretty sure. constructed situation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. At the time, my parents were together. Sure, you know, uh, we lived in a decent neighborhood. Sure, you know, um, my 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 goal was to finish school and go off and do other sure. things. Uh, again, you know, my parent, my dad was a, a, a not only was he a pilot, but he was a recording engineer. So we had a studio mm -hmm. in our basement, sure. which you know I thought was every average every day. Exactly. And then you know as I got older and I started thinking about, wow, wait a minute, we yeah. had a studio right, in our right. basement. Right. Not everybody has that. Right. Not everybody right. has a studio in their basement. Exactly. You know. So with that being said, when I started writing lyrics, mm -hmm. my lyrics were a representation of who I was. Exactly. And my presence was mm -hmm. a representation of I was a happy person. Exactly. And that, that's interesting because I remember um, yeah, that's me smiling right there. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I remember hearing how Sylvia when the message Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five's big hit mm -hmm. before it became the track that it became, it was like a like a almost like a last porch jungle jungle type track yes. with bongos and stuff. Originally. And she was looking for everybody in the label to do it and nobody wanted to do it. But at one point she wanted to give it to you guys. Exactly. And 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 during those days I was always eager to hear what was coming musically. I always sure. wanted to hear what any any new music. I would always hang out in the studios. I would always go to the sessions. Mm -hmm. You know, whoever was doing a session as long as like, you know, they would always let me come in and sit down and Certainly. listen. And and I, I originally heard that jungle kind of mm -hmm. sound. Right. And she thought about 
letting us do it. Mm -hmm. But because at that point we had such a all American, very image, much so, yeah. You know, yeah, y'all did have a very a, a very clean cut image. I mean, even in those days, believe it or not, I used to smoke cigarettes. Mm -hmm. But because of that era where you know you could not do certain things in public, I never smoked in public. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. And I smoked like a chimney when I was a kid. Yeah, wow. You know, yeah. yeah. But, I, but I was always careful to make sure, mm -hmm. you know, I never lit up a cigarette. Wow. So, so you know, I kind of gathered from interviews with people like the Crash Crew and the Funky Four and, and people like that and, and, and talking about their relationship to you guys as, as label mates. Of course, you were the biggest earner, especially before the Furious made the Hello. message. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, that's a whole other story, right? Well, <laughs> the biggest seller, right? Before, uh, yeah, <laughs> before the Furious Five made yeah. the message, yeah, hey, yeah. Hey, hey, tomato, tomato, yeah, yeah. right, <laughs> seller, uh, seller, earner, earner. A big difference, right? Yeah, um, we had to it, figure that one but, out. But you know, it's funny though, and this is you know, in all seriousness, you know, I went in Walgreens like last year. And I don't know what kind of greeting card it was, but I opened up a greeting card. You know how they yeah. had to play music. And there's, you know, a greeting card is actually playing the actual rapper's delight track. You yes. know, in addition to you know every little kid's movie and the yes. wedding singer and yes. you know so much. It's just such a big record. You know, even my son who's 16 and my daughter who's 22, they know every word of it. And not just because I'm their father and they've been around me, they would have no, known it's, it anyway. It's, it's American. It's world culture. It is. It really is. It, it, it is world culture. And you know that's the thing that I, I, I'm most proud of. Mm -hmm. But it has also been uh, a, a hurdle for me to overcome because, right? Uh, and we talk about this a lot in my life. I have the, the 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 blessing of having the best of both worlds. Certainly, I can walk down the street nine times out of ten. And, hey, how you doing? Mm -hmm. Whatever. But if I come back down that same street and somebody says, "This is Master G from mm -hmm. the Sugar Hill Gang," oh my god. Are you yeah. kidding me? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, so I, oh, I love that. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. yeah. So, uh, yeah. Let me tell you my Rapper's Delight story. Oh, everybody has one, right? Everybody's got one. My point being that there's so many vehicles that have been generated by this song. There's so many opportunities Certainly. that have been generated by this song that I've learned to... I, I love... <laughs> I, oh, hello. I loved it. I hated it. I've loved it. Mm -hmm. I've hated it. And I've loved it again. Right. And, you know, I always have to be conscious of the world's experience towards it. Right. You know? Yeah, I think that's something that musicians really don't don't realize. You know, um, people have an emotional connection to music. And it's not always just the song. I mean, it could be, oh, that was, you know, my grandmother was alive. We mm -hmm. used to party to that song. And yeah. I think a lot of times artists don't always, because I've been around people when they meet their favorite artists and they're telling them that long story of, hey, you know, and I know the artists probably hear that so much. That no, you do. They, you know, and, and, and you know, you got to sometimes kind of slow down and, and realize, wow, I am a, a major per part of that person's like, like when Prince stopped doing certain songs, I don't think he realized the crowd was like, you know, you got to do those. Well, songs no, 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 no. Let, let me. Uh, you I'm, know, what happens is you realize it, but it's so hard sometimes to do that same thing again and again right, and yeah, again yeah. and again That's and right. again and That's again. Right. Yeah, See, I, I would imagine. For, for, for a fan to hear Rapper's Delight, let's say, okay, I've come to Cologne, Germany. Somebody said, told me today, for uh -huh. example, that fan has probably been waiting. You know, mm -hmm. he hasn't seen. Now, I never saw. I've never seen Sugar Hill Gang. It's my first time. I've been listening to rap right. like for thirty years. Yeah, they waiting for that. Now right. I might have did that rapper's delight that verse M A S T. -E, I might have just did that two hundred times. That's right. Before yeah. I got to Cologne. Right. But that's why I say to people that you have to understand. And again, we're gonna. You know, because my life weaves in and out of my music. Certainly. My, my music is my vehicle, but there are so many other asset, as, aspects to, to me. And uh, what, what I say by that is if you understand other people's reality for situations, then you have a different appreciation for that reality. Exactly. Exactly. You know, Makes sense. Makes sense. so sometimes as a musician, you do get jaded and. Musicians are human beings too, especially right. a successful musician. Exactly. You know, exactly. who is known for a certain thing. That's right. That's right. Like Prince is known for, you know, uh, Little Red Corvette. Sure. You know, now he's got so many other songs in that catalog right. that he might want you to hear. Right. 
But if I'm a Prince fan, yeah, and I heard Little Red Corvette and it changed my life, yeah, I, that's what I just want to hear, right? Homeboy, I don't care what song you do, just, just <laughs> I'm sure waiting for it. it. Under, I, understood. It. That makes total this was sense. The greatest show in my whole life because yeah. I heard that song, right? Yeah. So yeah, that's that's interesting. That 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 that, that becomes what goes on with people, and so we, we're moving out of. Let's move out of that first five year period mm-hmm. with me. Sure. And, you know, by the by the fifth year, I'm realizing that it's not necessarily what I thought it was going to be. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So so you're saying the crowds are there. Yes. The popularity of the music is there. Absolutely. But not necessarily your pockets being. I'm not I'm not feeling like financially I should be where I'm at, you know. Okay. And okay. but as a young man and, and then here we go again and into what I would hope to do with this platform yes is continually educate and enlighten people anybody within the sound of my voice i would hope that you have an opportunity to let my experience be your best teacher certainly when you're young sometimes you don't understand what's going on but have don't give up that's the key right that's the key i didn't understand what was going on but i knew something was wrong right but what I had to do was I had to reinvent myself, which is another thing, key word that, you know, I'm going to emphasize today. Yes, yes. Reinventing yourself. Mm-hmm. I knew that that invention had been done at that point, but in order for me to thrive, in order for me to live, in order for me to be who I needed to be, which was always going to be me, Right. I had to reinvent myself. Certainly. And that's when I made the decision to step away. And what year are we talking about? 84, 85? 85. 80, 85. 85. So- yeah. So the last song you did with the label was "Living in the Fast Lane." That was that was the "Living in the Fast Lane," <laughs> "Living in the Fast Lane" album. Uh-huh. There you go. Smiling, smiling. There you go. Smiling. E- again. Even without your pockets, like even, you want to. Even not being looking at that, I, I would think that all of you were were of pleased. Of course you did, because once again, we're professional. We're yeah. successful musicians. We have a fan base. Somebody said, "Say cheese," and you said, cheese. "And and you, you know, boom, you know, you do you do what you do." At that point, I was like, "Okay, I, I gotta I gotta figure something out." And and was really at the end of the rope. I mean, mm-hmm. we're talking about you know uh, e- evicted out of uh, uh, apartments and cars repossessed, oh, wow. and you know with a hit record with, with, with several hit records, with not eight several hit, hit records, with greatest hits and everything yeah, else. Yeah, I'm talking about. I was looking for the next move, right? You know, and 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 this is a very uh, crazy transition because what I did was I was look. I said, well, I'm going to break down and get a job. Uh huh. And, 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 oh, and the other thing, too, is that between 79 and 85, the opportunity for a recording, a rap recording artist was very, very, those opportunities were narrow. Very much so. Again, the journey is partly the reason why, uh, the, the reason why I call this the journey is partly because here we are in 2019 and I'm, on internet radio, sure, and sure. you know, we you have Ice Cube doing film, and sure, you got sure. Dr. Dre doing yeah. headphones, and so <laughs> in '85, man, you cut a record and you toured, yeah. And if, and, and if you didn't have a hit record and you didn't understand the nature of what was going on, you sat. And at that time, you could turn the radio on and not hear a rap song all day. Exactly. The only time you would hear them might be late night mix shows on the weekends. Now exactly. it's the opposite. You turn the radio and you can't not hear a rap song. It's a total different world. It's totally flipped. So that's that's why I say, I said, okay, I'm gonna break down and get a job, a regular mm-hmm. job. Okay. Reading the newspaper, and I was looking in the one ads because at that point I had dropped out of high school. Mm-hmm. I had no job experience. The only job I ever had, I worked at a five and dime in Hackensack, New Jersey. Right. And I saw an ad in the newspaper, and it said, "Free to travel, no experience necessary." Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, oh, and no experience necessary, and free to travel. Yeah. But hey, <laughs> those were the. How could it be wrong, right? <laughs> And so, and that, and that's what I did. So I ended up calling the number, and it turned out to be the direct door-to-door sale business. Okay. And so, with a, a garbage bag and an overnight bag, mm. and ten dollars that I borrowed from somebody, mm-hmm. I got in a, 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 a Buick two twenty five. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and rode up to Springfield, Massachusetts, and I met. And ended up becoming a part of the industry that saved my life. Bottom line. Bottom line. Because what happened with the magazine business is they gave me an opportunity to learn what I needed to know in order to continue to grow. 
And okay. that's something that I that I that I talk about a lot. Um, once you know what to do, mm -hmm. as long as you do what you know, you're going to continue to grow. Exactly. You know, and 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 that's the thing that the magazine business gave me the opportunity. So I started out as a door to door salesman. So okay. here I am, and we got to put this into context now. Mm -hmm. This is 1985. Right. Uh, I, you know, I'm 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 American Bandstand, Soul right. Train, Don Cornelius, right, Solid right. Gold. Exactly. I'm driving Rolls Royces, yeah. living in mansions, mm -hmm. this that and the other thing. And homeboy, I was literally walking down the street, door to door, going door to door. Knocking on people's door. Hi, I just stopped by to see you. My name is Guy. Guy O'Brien. I'm with the Big Work Program. <laughs> so how was that transition? Was was, was did you feel oh that, that was demeaning at all? Or did, was, was I went through every mental breakdown mm. known to man without being able to go someplace and just which 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 most frustrated musicians do. They get into the you know the, the pity party, mm -hmm. or they might be unfortunately, and this happens a lot. They might be addicted to a, a you know something, yeah, some and and, and right. you and you just go into this whole state of depression. Certainly, for some reason, again, and we're gonna go back to the beginning again. Moving forward, moving forward. All mm -hmm. I knew how to do was move forward. Exactly, and I figured it out. I figured it out, and what I figured out being in that situation is I saw people that were like me. Mm -hmm. But they were succeeding, and I learned what they knew, and I grew, and that was what happened. Because of that business, I, you know, I went from being a salesperson to being a field manager. From being a field manager, I started, you know, my first sales organization. I built that sales organization, and in the process of doing that, I was able to kind of, as I tell people, prepare for the next chapter of my life. Okay. Because if I had to, if I would have had to go day to day at Walmart. Sure, sure. Not taking anything away from anybody who works at Walmart. Certainly, but shout they, out to everybody who. But works they were on the first rap successful but rap. They, but exactly, they didn't fly on the Concord to Paris, right, and to talk to Don Cornelius. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Uh, you know, I'm figuring out how to, you know, bound. I call it. I used to call it becoming a civilian again. Yep. You know, and I had to. And I had to navigate through that. Mm. You know, while I'm being. The doors being slammed in my face. Exactly. The cops are being called on me. Mm -hmm. I'm working in, I mean, I'm literally walking down the street in Omaha, Nebraska, in the middle of a snowstorm, sliding down, wow. you know, the street. Uh, we, we're living three to a room, and I don't have, you know, the top tier business, so they got me sleeping on the floor when I'm used to sleeping in suites. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's a, that's a hell of an adjustment. So, and you, yeah. Did you have a child by that point? you have a son by I that had, point? I had, and, and that was the other thing. That was, that was, that was my biggest reason right. for reinventing myself. Right. I personally never and still to this day don't know my my biological father. Never met the right. guy. I don't right. know who he is. Certainly. And my goal once I was in the situation of having my oldest son, Guy O'Brien Jr. Have that, yeah. Right. He wasn't gonna be sure. that situation. And right. and I did not want the dope dealer and I did not want any other individual being his hero. So I exactly. had to once again we'll use this word, reinvent myself. And and the business taught me that. The business now, gave me that. Now to provide some context for people who don't know your story, and I don't think a lot of people do. Um, so eighty four, by the time you were walking away on your own, you know, you on, on your own, you walked away at a time right around the time when LL Cool J is signing yes. Def Jam. Yes. And I, I think that's very important. Yes, uh, rap is going into what, what I call this next school. Yes, or I, I call it the middle school. Yes. Um, LL is signing his first contract in 84. Def Jam is a brand new label in 84. And rap is, yeah. uh, you know, about to kick the door in on the mainstream. Yeah. You know, which, which you guys built the foundation for, you know, the next guys about to come and lay, you know, lay the bricks on top of that. Run DMC is continuing their dominance. Did you ever feel like, oh, wow, look, you know, that's something that I started. Did you ever miss it or feel like, oh. I always missed it. Okay. I missed it every day. That was part of my struggle because... You know, I I'd be in a van sometimes mm. in a, some city somewhere, sure. and you know, that business is a young person's business. Mm -hmm. So of course, I was twenty three at the time. So the people that I was around, they were twenty three, and you know, and twenty, and eighteen, and seventeen. So certainly, and when you're in and in predominantly black, mm -hmm. so if I'm in a van of let's say eight people, and we're all predominantly black and we're young, what are we gonna listen to? Right, exactly. They, we're gonna listen to rap music. Yeah. They're gonna turn. They're gonna find the rap station. Oh, so I'm sitting in the van. Yeah. You know, and LL is blasting on the radio. Yeah, yeah. But I'm trying to figure out how I'm gonna get lunch today. Yeah. Well, wow. You know. Wow. And he's 
not on the radio, but he's on television. Mm -hmm. And like you said, running them have now blown up with the Aerosmith situation. Yeah. Uh, it, it, and it just keeps getting, you know, bigger and bigger, bigger and bigger, and right. bigger and bigger, you know, hammer, mm -hmm. hammer oh, now man. becomes a part of the situation. Yeah. And then he hooks up with Pepsi and then he becomes, oh, man. you know, a, 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 Unreal, un, 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 unbelievable. And then, of course, that whole West Coast situation. Yeah, yeah. Rappers have cartoons. By that point, Kid and Play had a cartoon. Hammer had a car. It was like... You name it. In, in every household at that point. Exactly. Okay. And so was I. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. That's that's a hell of a story, man. Um, now, I know at one point, I don't want to skip over this, you did do a record. It might have been 85. You were on Atlantic Records, I think it was? I was. I, I, it was a record called Do It. I, I don't know if there's a... An image for do it, there, Jacob. That was that was my attempt, and I think Marley Mall produced it. He did produce. Okay, that. that's, that's very true. Wow, that's very true. A lot Shout of out to know Marley that. Mall. Yeah, yeah, do it. Well, um, what happened at that point was, being the enterprising individual that I was, mm -hmm. I saw that the group was not functioning. Right. You know, uh, Mike was going through whatever he was going through. Hank right. was going through whatever he was going through. Sure. And in my mindset, I was like, well, look, I came here by myself. Mm -hmm. So as far as I'm concerned, you know. Ain't nobody gonna take care of me but me. Right. So I when I left the label, I met at a session the AR director for Atlantic. Okay. I met him at a session that Doug Wimbush mm -hmm. was doing with some other guys. Big up Doug Wimbush, Big my, up my Doug man. Yeah, Great color, bass player, yeah. Amazing bass player. Wood brass and steel. Wood yeah. brass and steel. Yeah. And so I met this the the, the A and R guy. Mm -hmm. And Believe it or not, the reason why, there it is right there, the reason yep, why he spoke to me is because he said he could not believe my attitude. He said I had such an amazing attitude mm -hmm. coming from what he knew had happened. Right. He said, man, how are you so, you know, how are you yeah, just so positive? Stuff, right. How are you so upbeat? Right. And, you know, and, and I told him, I said, look, man, I, I st I, I'm living, I'm still here, I'm moving, I'm grooving, and I'm looking for the next thing. Right. And that's when we started conversating. Right. Wow. So you just walked into a deal on Atlantic. That's I crazy. walked into a deal. Produced by Marley Moore. I mean, produced Marley, by Marley. Marley hadn't produced, he hadn't even produced MC he, Sam by then. So he, it's, it's, he, it's no. barely a juice crew. Exactly. Wow. It was so early. And we talk about this all the time that mm -hmm. so many moves that I've made in my life, yeah. I've made them ahead of yeah, man. what was going to happen. Yeah. You know, that so many times. That is crazy. Yeah. You expound on some of those if you, if, if well, that's not I mean, jumping too far into you. No, 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 no. And, 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 well, now we're talking about this situation on this platform that we're on right now. Right. So, okay, we, we're going to pass, you know, the magazine thing, 2005. Mike and I always stayed friends. Right. 2005, Mike calls me, he says, looks, man, I'm not dealing with the label anymore. Do you want to do some new music? We always okay. had an agreement that whatever he wanted to do, I would do as long as we weren't a part of the label. Right. So we get up, we start, we're down the road. So now I'm with Sugar Hill. We're former members of Sugar Hill. We're, sure. we're original members of Sugar Hill. Right. We're doing everything in our power because we're being being constantly dealt with and fought with by, God rest his soul, Joey Robinson. Certainly. Who would, did not want us to continue with the Sugar Hill situation. Right. And I wanted to do, again, radio. Here I am again. I'm saying, let's do a radio show. Let's do a radio show. We, this is early, this early, is early. This is 2006, 2007, right. 2008. I'm still working on this radio thing. 2009, in New York City, I was living in Manhattan, mm -hmm. and we got an opportunity to deal with a guy who had a vision. Check this out, mm -hmm. to do an internet radio station. Yeah. I mean, an internet television station. Oh wow, he was early. Internet television station. Yeah. The name of the station was called. It was called Uber TV. Okay. We had it. It was a studio. In Manhattan, okay, he had a sports show. He had a he had a stockbroker show. They were they were doing a, like what we're doing now. Certainly, they were doing this with Al Sharpton. They were fo photographing and, and and running his show wow. on their network. And we put together a show, Mike Hen, uh, Diamond, and myself. We put a show together called Raw Sugar. So it was wow. Raw Sugar with Wonder Mike and the Master G. So okay. now, now check out the setup because <laughs> we had no producers, we had no writers, we had no dress designers. Okay. And what what they did was, it, it was archived footage. Okay. From and every Tuesday, just like Thursday is now that I'm right. doing this. Right. Every Tuesday we would come to the studio and shoot four 45 minute episodes. Oh wow. And I'm talking about costume changes, content changes. Oh man, y'all were early. Y'all were early. Uh, and the whole nine yards. And what mm -hmm. would happen is 
they would put all that information together and they would put it on the archives and you could go to Uber TV mm. and, you know, you know how people man. do. Yeah. I, I looks a little bit. I yeah. don't know. I want to see this. Right, right. I want to see that. Oh, wow. And now look where we're man, at. Yeah. Now everybody else, at. everybody else is caught up to where you were. That's crazy. Everybody else is caught up to where we were already on the breaking, you know, edge of. That's, that's truly incredible. Yeah. So now, where was... During that time when you and Mike were first starting to get together, before, and you do have your name back now, right? You guys, yes, can, we we, you, we can, and we are, and have been performing, uh, as, performing the as the Sugar Hill Gang. You know, we for a moment, you know, before we got our name back, we used to perform as Rappers Delight. That was, I remember that. Yeah, that was that was what we were doing. And you were but, MG Squad at one time. But we, initially, going back to the beginning, that 2005 period, we yeah. were MG Squad. Uh, and then we were former members of, and then we were original members right. of. And now you got all that legality. And now we got all that legality together. And and then I'm gonna say big shout out to the Robinson family, mm -hmm. uh, Leland Robinson, mm -hmm. super super uh, 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 business partner of mine. We yes. do we do great things. We're group working on the 40th anniversary together. Cool. cool. And we are actively and have been and will continue to be members of the Sugar Hill Gang, actively performing. Uh, Great. Under the Sugar Hill Gang name. Yes. Great. Now, in that interim, when you when you first started talking to Mike again, when he was still doing shows with Hank, what, did you have any relationship with Hank at that point? Yeah. Well, Conversations. I never spoke to Hank directly during the period of um, between eighty five and two thousand five. Yeah, Hank, right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Big uh -huh. shout out to Pastor, yep, and, yep, yep. And, and we we miss him dearly. Definitely. Um, I didn't I didn't see him directly, but we were never at odds. Right. Mike and I have always been and will always be. Best friends. We are literally brothers. Okay. You know. Okay. We we knew of each other mm -hmm. in Englewood because he was in Sound on Sound. I was face two, but we didn't really get together right until really the first night that we cut the record. Okay. Because the first night we cut the record, Mike didn't have no place to stay. Mm. Oh wow. Yeah. Mike had he was he was homeless at the time, and uh, was getting ready to cross the street from the studio and go sleep in the park. Wow. Yeah. And I and, and, wow. and and Sylvia actually she was like, well, where's Mike going? Mm -hmm. You know, and I said, well, I, from what I understand, I think he, you know, he's, she was like, no, no, no. So I went over to him and I said, Mike, you know, Sylvia's like said, you can come up to her house. And he was very apprehensive. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I said, well, you know what? I'll tell you what, I'll go up to the house with you and we'll stay up there together. Okay. And if, you know, just to make sure everything is cool. Okay. And I, I mean, I'm literally just meeting him. Sure. Yeah. But wow, that wow. was the that was the beginning of, of our of friendship. That bond, yeah. yeah. That was the beginning. I felt like, and from that point on, I always felt like. I had to look out for him. Yeah, I got you. Know, you. Like he I got was my you. older brother. And right, I, and, and you right. Know, I had to look. So that's dope. And yeah. both of you guys are musicians too. That a lot of people don't know. The, the, again, here we go with the journey. Uh -huh. You know, I as a, as a child, I started out playing drums because mm -hmm. my father was recording with a woman named Gloria Toot at a at a, at a studio in Englewood okay. called Town Sound. Okay, he was doing a lot of engineering, and he would be in the studio. And my thing was, you know, I I could either play the piano or play the drums. Okay. And I decided to play the drums. So, yes. Okay. I, I ended up playing the drums, and I ended up, you know, being in the band in my neighborhood. Okay. That kind of thing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so that, that, is, that is an incredible journey. And, yeah. And, and to, to come back and, and still do the Sugar Hill Gang thing today, you know, that's a full circle. Well, that's the thing. So, what ended up happening is I came to terms with who I am. Mm -hmm. I came to terms with what I'm responsible for. Okay. And I came to terms with... I've been given an opportunity to do what it is that I've been given a gift to do. Certainly. Becoming successful in, the, in that business, it gave me the platform and the ability to be ready for the opportunity to present itself. My journey was not completed. Even though I stopped in 85, the journey wasn't over. Right. And uh, I tell people this all the time, the music stayed around mm -hmm. and the group stayed around long mm -hmm. enough for me to want to get with it. Right. And come back to it. That's why I say, you know, mm -hmm. I, I loved it, I hated it, I loved it, I hated it. Sure. I loved it, I hated it, and now I love it. Right. And that's the thing. And you know? it, it, from the appearance, correct me if I'm wrong, you have a little more creative control over it now. Oh, see, and this is the thing. I do it now on my terms. There you go. Yeah, I when, do it when now you, on my when terms. When you want. And, and, I do yeah. everything I do now, I do when I want, you know, uh, how I want, mm -hmm. where I want, um, shows, Anything that happens now, it's it's on my terms. Okay, that's and, great. And, and it's and, and 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 again, that's also you know a big light to let people know too. When you get to the position to be able to call the shots, mm -hmm. make sure you call the right shots. Very true. 
And the best way that I have found to call the right shots mm-hmm. is to surround yourself with the right people. Exactly. Like yourself. Exactly. Well, I appreciate that, man. I appreciate <laughs> like that. Like yourself. Like yourself. Well, again, you know, talking about coming full circle, you know, I think I I was looking at our interview today because I kind of spruced it up um, a little bit. And you, you can go to, uh, I have to plug myself, um, yes, please foundationhiphop.com. Yeah, that's where we're at right now. Now we're, out, now we're going to start plugging ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> foundationhiphop.com and check out check out my stuff if you go to lessons you'll see like the little mini documentaries I do on YouTube but I also have interviews and I did an interview with you I think it was 2003 it's been that long it's been, it's been a was long it time was it 2003? yeah because y'all were just doing MG Squad at that point so it's 2000, between 2003 2005 yep so it's been that long and um Really, I was the first person that you gave a full interview to. Yes, because I was very, I was extremely reclusive for many, 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 many years. Certainly. Even coming back, I mm-hmm. didn't talk to people. You know, I, I, even to this day, I, te- I still keep tend to keep a pretty low profile. Sure. So now, fifteen, you know, almost fifteen or so years later, you know, here we are sitting here, and that's my point. And so, so yeah. And so now, I'm actually ready to really become a part of this social media thing. Yes. Uh, you know, I got the website up now. And what's the I website? Got, the website is realmasterg.com. Then I got the Instagram, right? And that's uh, and it's at what Real Master Real G? Master G. Uh-huh. And we're 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 working on the Twitter. You know, keep it. Give me give me some time. That's right. You know, uh, the, my people around me they, they 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 look at me as the old guy. Triple O G, trip, 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 triple O G. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. But listen, man. Uh, First, I want to say to everybody that has tuned in or will be tuning in that I appreciate the love. I appreciate all the support. I appreciate all the understanding. This is a work in progress. We're developing this thing as we go. Yes. The longest journey starts with the first step. That's right. This is the first step to the next chapter of so many different things that I want to do with my opportunity. Yes. Uh, Jake Kwan is going to be a constant, you know, uh, contributor to this situation. Indeed. Jeremy, of course, you know, listen, vision, um, you know, all my people, everybody that works with me. And then without question, uh, my fans look for me um, this weekend. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to be in Fort Lauderdale uh, okay. on Sunday. Uh, I will be in Jazz in the Garden on the 8th of next month. Okay. But the 15th, I will be at the John Arms Theater in Englewood, New Jersey. We're doing uh, New the York theater. Legends of Hip Hop show. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I'm. it's almost like my homecoming. Okay. For this, this situation. Okay. Wow. Yeah. And then moving forward, we're going to be overseas. Uh, we're doing the 40th anniversary, uh-huh. but every Thursday at uh, five o'clock, we're going to be doing this. Jacob, you can bring up some of the fever, just flash a few of the fever pictures up, just just to show you how far you guys go back. You know, when people have critiqued you <laughs> negatively, you know, this is the disco fever. This is the mecca of hip hop, and this is the sugar dress to kill, in, boy, dress to kill in the disco fever. So look at that. So you know, um, there's no question of the authenticity. I remember those shoes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're shocked. Whoa, look at that. Look at that. You and Sal, you, so yeah, yeah. So, look at Sal. So wow, the, the authenticity is there, man. Nobody can question. Um, nobody can question that. And that's what we 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 hope to do with this show as well. We want to let people know that, you know, yes, many groups were put together, but right, we, we have just as much offer because you know one one record is one thing, right? But you're looking at. You know, yeah. Apache, Eighth Wonder, Showdown, Sugar, Sugar Hill Groove, Groove, Lover and You, Lover and You. you know, and that was another. You know, you, you guys know. were the first to do a love song, but before anybody else. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, first to endorse. You know, you did. But you had a Budweiser commercial. I remember when I was a kid. Yeah. You know, you had first to have. You know, America. There's it, so much know. to talk about. There's it so is. So many and, things and, to do. And, and again, and we will. This is the Look, Listen, and Learn show with the Master G. Definitely. I'm rocking with my man Jay Quan. Yes, sir. We're on ListenVision.com. We, we, we thank you so much for everybody. Uh, shout out to uh, my girl, Julie, that uh, that let us come on television this morning. And um, mm-hmm. my man, Peter, at the Washington Business Journal. Big time shout out to all my fans and my friends and my family. And I'm getting a little emotional. <laughs> You'll be all right, man. You'll okay. be all right. <laughs> I'm showing my, show my smallest spot. <laughs> Peace out, y'all. Peace. <laughs> this
just one look, listen and learn. learn.